What's going on folks, it's Mike here, and in this lesson in the C++ series, we're going to be talking about loops. Loops are the fundamental construct for building algorithms. They allow us to repeat work over some duration or indefinitely. So let's go ahead and take a look at C++'s loop facilities. So I want to go ahead and start with one of the fundamental loops that we've looked at before, for loops, and just go ahead and introduce the syntax and we'll work with them a little bit. And last time we were working with arrays, as you might recall. So I'm going to go ahead and just create something, array or ARR for short here, and create a few elements here. So here's the syntax for creating a few different elements in our array. And if we don't specify a size by default, we can populate an array of three items with the values one, three, and five accordingly. So that's just a little continuation of our previous lesson. Now let's see how we would loop or iterate through each of these elements using a for loop. And again, different languages have different syntaxes, but for the most part, the C-based languages start off with a for, a statement where I can initialize some variable, such as i, which usually stands for an index, an initial value, and then some condition for which we'll iterate on. So while i is less than three, and then an expression that we evaluate i plus plus, which is shorthand, and I can rewrite this as i equals i plus one. Okay, and then we have the curly braces, which denotes the scope here. And we've talked about scope a little bit, so this variable i will only be available within these curly braces here. And let me go ahead and just print out the value of our array, add each of the indices, and we'll just go ahead and terminate that line there with an end line. So let's go ahead and compile and see how our loop works here. And this program is called loops, and I'll just output it as proc. And if I run this, you'll accordingly see one, three, and five as we iterate through each iteration of this loop, first running through with our initial condition of zero. So zero is the first value that's passed in. And then when I reach the end of this curly brace, this expression is um, updated if the following condition passes. So was i less than three? Well, yes it was. So then we update the condition. And so on, this will execute again, this next time with i of one. So we'll go through here, one is less than three. So then we will add to it and have two. Two is taken in here, so we get our final value of five. And then we go through here, uh, evaluate to see if our condition holds after evaluating this expression and then eventually terminate through the loop. Now, one thing I will mention is these arguments are actually optional. So I could rewrite this loop in a little bit of a weird way. I could declare i outside of here, get rid of i, still keep the condition, and just increment i as such here. Now, this extends the scope of i, so it'll be available later on. So folks don't typically do this, but I just want to show you that this program will essentially do the same thing and that each of these arguments are optional. If I don't specify anything in here, so for example, if I just have empty uh, semicolons here and I give it the condition, and well, I'll have to just put this in quotations because there's no i, let's go ahead and see what happens here. Now this program will just run forever and it's an infinite loop, a loop that's just going to run forever. I'll hit control C to terminate the program here and then we can uh, modify it back to its original state here. So this is the for loop. Now this isn't the only type of loop that C++ supports. C++ also supports range based for loops. And let me go ahead and give an example here. And on CPP reference, I'll scroll all the way down to see the range-based for loop, just so you can see the documentation. And this allows you to loop over a range. Well, that's sort of what we're doing here. We're going through the entirety of this collection here. In fact, a common pattern you'll see, and I'm going to just refactor this a little bit with our other array type that we've looked at. And I'll create an array, and I'll just call this array2. And we need to set the type and its collection size. And we can also initialize this with some elements. And actually, let me make sure I don't uh, make a mistake here. And I'm going to just make sure I put this right after the data type, what it is and its size. And I can immediately, with the same curly braces, just initialize this element here. So again, the common pattern that you're going to see when using a data collection like this is not having to guess the size. 
but just saying array2, there's a member function called size, and let's make sure that we're going through array2 here. So that would be a common pattern if we want to just look through everything. We just say, hey, however big the array is, whether we know its size or are storing it somewhere or are using it through one of our data structures built into the language, like std array, we just iterate through everything. But what range-based for loops do is they allow us to iterate through an entire collection. And they sort of have that intent based off of the syntax. So let me go ahead and show you uh, how to do that. So for this, we have four. And I'm just following along in the documentation here. Some variable, just like we had in our for loop, with a colon. And then, well, what collection are we iterating through? In this statement, meaning that we're saying, well, what's the actual data structure? So let me go ahead and just write this out. So we'll have four. And we have, well, what is our data? Some integer i, let's say. And I'll put a colon here and array2. And let's just go ahead and do the same thing and print it out here. And just paste that off here. And if I extend this just to make it a little bit bigger, you'll see that, hmm, well, we almost have the same thing, but I didn't uh, initialize these uh, values properly, it looks like. Or rather, I'm actually just doing something funky here because, well, the actual expression I'm getting back here, i, is, well, some index here. So let me actually fix this up here. And this is still an int i, except I want to rename this something better, just like element, because we're already looping through each of the items here. So we're not indexing through them. So let me go ahead and just put element here and rebuild this, rerun it, and now we can see one, three, and five, which matches our other for loop here. So that's kind of cool that we can just do that. Again, we don't have to pay attention to the actual index and maybe messing that up if we mess up our expression here. We're just going to loop through every element here. So this also works for raw arrays here. So if I just get rid of that uh, two here and rerun it, again, you'll see the same values, one, three, and five which matches what we have in our original array here. So range-based for loops work for raw loops as well as data structures built into the standard template library here. Now, I wanna show you one more thing with for loops specifically, and that is that oftentimes how you're going to see this written is with the auto keyword. And that means we don't have to deduce what the type is. The compiler will automatically figure it out here. So that's something that you'll see. We haven't talked about auto yet, but if I compile this, it'll work and it'll run just the same. And the last optimization I will show you, though it's less important in this particular example because we're working with primitive types, is often you'll see an ampersand after the auto here. And what that's doing is it's avoiding making copies of these elements here, which is something that we got to talk about later. But just a little fair warning that you might see this syntax as you move further, and I might occasionally use it, and I'll re-explain it when appropriate. But regardless, here's how we do a range-based for loop. Now, with that in mind, there are other loops that we have in our programs, such as while loops here. So I could do something like while true, and this will just indefinitely print uh, text to our standard output uh, forever. And again, what the while statement is doing is, well, we're going to evaluate this condition first and then just print off this line here. And then when we hit this bracket here, we'll jump back up to our while statement, reevaluate this condition, and so on. I'm going to make this a little bit more interesting with, say, a countdown here. Uh, and let's just go ahead and create a countdown here. And I'll set it to three. And we'll say while countdown is greater than zero, let's just print out the countdown value. And we'll update that every time in our loop with a minus minus here. So let's rebuild, rerun, and you'll see here the three, two, and one. Okay, so that's how while loops work. Now there is one other type of loop that I want you to be aware of, uh, though I use it uh, less frequently, and that is the do while loop. So instead you have do at the top here, and then the actual condition here, while, is evaluated at the end here. So you have something like this. So let's go ahead and uh, try that out again. Now, let me go ahead and reinitialize uh, countdown to three here, just so you can see the difference here. 
Um, and I'll actually put another uh, end line here just so you can see the separation with another C out here uh, and an end line. And I'm going to make this just a little bit smaller just so you can see everything in the difference between these loops. And let's try to rerun it. And again, you'll see the same three, two, one. These loops here work the same essentially, but the difference is this will always evaluate this portion of the code one time, and then it'll check the condition at the end versus checking the condition at the top to see if this condition is true or not. So the scenarios where you need one or the other usually vary. Most of the time in code, you'll be using while loops here. Now, while we're talking about loops here, and here's the different kinds that we have, whether it's just a regular index-based for loop where you're checking some condition, having an initialization statement, and evaluating some expression, a range-based loop here where you're iterating through some collection, one element at a time, and then while loops and do while loops. What I want you to think about is that these are, again, the foundations of how we build algorithms. Most of the time, what we're doing in our code is, well, looking at a collection of data, iterating through in some pattern, and either modifying or recalling that data. So I just wanted to show you something that's kind of cool that we can look at in our algorithm library in C++ here, which I'll just highlight at the top. And a particularly interesting function, or one that's kind of fun to look at, is the fill function here. And basically what this does is it takes an array, and we fill it up with an initial value. Uh, and I shouldn't say just an array, it could be any other type of collection here. So what we're going to do is essentially just mimic this example here. And let me go ahead and just comment out uh, this block of code, which I'll do with a uh, full comment. And then I'm just going to come down here, create, uh, let's just create a uh, array similar to like what we had before with an integer. And let's just put three components here, my array. And we're not going to initialize the actual values here. So we'll use a range-based for loop just to see what happens to be in that uh, loop here. So in my array, and let's just print it out, uh, each element, and we'll put a new line between them. Let's go ahead and run it. And again, we get garbage because we haven't initialized our values. So let's go ahead and run this fill algorithm. So standard fill. And again, it's going to take, and there's different ways to write this, but the beginning of my array, I'm just going to do it a little bit different than here, to the, well, the end of my array. Fill up all the values with, and we want to make something reasonable. Zero might not be uh, predictable. So how about 1,024? So that should set all of our three values here. So from the beginning to the end to this value, 1024 here. And we're going to need to include the algorithm library in order to use this. So I'll include algorithm, hop down to the bottom of my code so you can see it, recompile, rerun, and just like that, you can see that, well, this algorithm must have looped through all of our elements, again, from the beginning of our collection to the end, and populated each of the elements with 1024. And this is just a nice or an elegant way rather than writing for loops or the other looping mechanisms that we've done. But it's important to understand when we look at some of these functions or other algorithms in the wild that they're built on top of loops. That's our essential tool in programming. All right, so one quick uh, view just so you can see all that we did uh, in the lesson here with our initial discovery of arrays or reinvestigation of them, this time initializing them in a little bit of a different way working with array data structure again, looping through in two different ways with two different types of for loops, a little countdown with a while loop and a do loop, and just thinking a little bit about how loops are used in algorithms behind the scenes and another concise way to write our code, and then finally looping through each of our elements to check and verify that we have populated it. All right, folks, so I hope that's been an interesting introduction to loops. Chances are, if you've programmed before, you've seen loops, for loops, range loops, and various programming languages. But hopefully this gave you something interesting to think about, or at least you're getting used to me bringing up the algorithm library here to show you some neat tricks in C++. If you're enjoying this so far, well, that's good news because we've got more coming. We'll see you in the next one.